Hey, this is John Wolf, Chief Fitness Officer at Onnit Labs. And on today's episode of Ever Forward Radio, I share a little bit about my journey and not just the highlight reel, but obviously the pitfalls of my path and my choices that led me finally, after many mistakes, to a place where I now am moving ever forward with the support of an amazing community that I'm part of here at Onnit. Dude, John. Hey. Finally, man, finally. Um, today's been a day I got to really just sit back and kind of pay attention to some of my own lessons of uh, shit happens. <laughs> so thank you, man. Make the most of it, man. I'm glad to, we, we found the space. We got Literally, some time. Yeah. yeah. Well, first of all, we have a connection because when I was calling you earlier, I saw that phone number from Northern California and it immediately took me back to that time of my life as 18, 19 year old young man, young soldier stepping out into his own. And uh, I had a really, really unique experience in Northern California during that time. And uh, I know that's a big part of your story as well. That John is not this John, but that John was necessary for this John, right? Yeah. I mean, this John is built on a lot of decisions that, you know, looking back might be regretful, but Mm. we're really a platform for, you know, doing the hardest things and drawing from a well of strength and resolve I didn't know I had until I had to face Mm. kind of the darkness, the self-imposed darkness that I lived in at that point. Yeah. Um, One thing I discovered about you was that you kind of had a why me or even a why them scenario. You lost a couple of people close in your life, Mm -hmm. grandparents, one kind of like right after the other, uh, you, your grandfather, almost like a year exactly to the day of your grandmother, right? Exactly. So right after the clock struck midnight. That's right. Minutes yeah. after. And that made it the year, exactly a year as it passed midnight. So wow. it was it was a surreal experience because yeah. it just seems so odd how things could line up so yeah. precisely. But uh but yeah, it was those two Two subsequent deaths, and then you know they say things happen in threes, right? Unfortunately, yeah. unfortunately. So just a few months later, my uncle had committed suicide, and I was really most shook by mm. the initial loss. My grandmother, who I was really close with, but that kind of opened the door, as you said, like mm. why them or why me? And it's kind of it's interesting how those two things can be correlated, mm. right? I'm externalizing like the unfair reality of, of the world. Yeah. Cause I'm like overly romantic or just uh, a hopeless romantic. And, yeah. it, you know, and I think a lot of us, we, we grow up yeah. with that little bit of innocence and, and uh, you know, the world can strip you of that. And sometimes if you're not prepared or you don't have a framework to accept like good things happening to good people and, and mm-hmm. uh, you know, that, my feeling was that my grandmother deserved a better exit Mm -hmm. and I just didn't feel it was fair. It really shook me to the core. It seems so simple, but it really changed my perspective around whether or not the righteous are treated right, you know? And so it was just a really tough situation, but then the kind of everything kind of packed on more and more weight and it, it really, uh, it drove me into a state of, of great apathy. Right? Mm, okay, and so that was that was kind of the uh, the litmus the 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 entry point into a whole world of of poor decisions. I'd say interesting, interesting. Yeah. It's it's interesting interesting to me the uh, the decisions we make or the decisions we don't make after such major life events as a traumatic experience, a car crash, the death of a loved one. Um, Just for kind of context here, we, we share that. I lost my father at age of 19 and similar to you, it was just this guy, he was my hero. He was such a great contributor to the community and he died to a terminal illness, a very, very cruel illness. 
And that was immediately where I went as well. And so for just to kind of share with you for, for context there, like I've been there, I know what that experience is like. And then right after that, we have, I think, one of two decisions to make. And I'm going to be angry and bitter and, you know, perhaps kind of air quote here, spiral out of control a little bit to, to try and deal with that. Or you accept it. Which one of those two did you go down? Oh, it was definitely option number one. Okay. And, and, and not necessarily so consciously, you know, making the decision to spiral out of control, but th mm. that's kind of why I, I said apathy, right? Because yeah. it was just a lack of connection to purpose because of that over romanticized perspective, mm. you know, stripping away that, that attachment to, you know, good and evil, righteousness, not, mm. and, and, and fairness in terms of how the universe worked. Right. And all that just kind of went out the window for you. Exactly. And so, you know, I, I kind of feel like I was almost testing whether or not there was a place in this world for me to continue to, wow. to be right. Like if they can't be here, then what are my odds? Exactly. I mean, to some degree, I think that that was an undertone to many of those decisions is just test, mm. test whether or not I was meant to continue being in this world. Where did that immediately take you when, when you're having these thoughts of where am I meant to be in this world? What is, what is my purpose? I'm assuming like, where did you actually go with that? You know, it's funny because it was, it was actually, there's a lot of duality to it. Huh. And one side of my life, I poured myself into a variety of different uh, work scenarios. I was working in in hospitality, so mm. I, was, I worked at two different hotels. I was working some front desk stuff, and then I was working night audit. So that was a pretty big spread of hours. And then I was working, I was doing some marketing for a high end real estate firm in Carmel, California, which oh, I yeah, like you said, Mon yeah, man. Monterey area. You're familiar with, <laughs> and so I was working like 96 hours a week. It was ridiculous. But I was still, you know, a young man and my friends would like, get out of here. Come on, just mm. go ahead and party. And then I kind of managed that, kind of burning it at both ends. Yeah. At yeah. some point in time, I found that the distraction, the social distraction and the party scene really kind of took a bigger and bigger mm. chunk of the time and energy in my life, right? Do you think that that would have been a tendency of yours regardless or do you feel like kind of stepping out into the world wh wh when did this happen how old were you when your grandmother passed and your grandfather and so my grandmother 24 years ago okay. grandfather 23 and okay. then my uncle you know just shortly thereafter so do you think like my real question here is like at this certain age i think when us as humans we go through a major traumatic event i think it's more impactful and we perceive it as more cataclysmic just because of where we are. We're coming out of the womb again, so to speak. And we're stepping into our own identity, whether that's we're leaving home, we're flying the nest, we're getting a job, we're going to college. That compounded with this trauma, I think just, it's almost like, do we even have a chance? You know? I, th I think that's definitely part of the inner dialogue, right? Yeah. And so I kind of tried to walk both worlds for a period of time. And I think I was pretty successful at it for, you know, relatively, you know, you can only, you only have so many hours and so much time and energy. Only so much energy. Yeah. yeah. But at, at some point in time, you know, I was always so introverted. Mm. Uh, I was very introspective. I was able to like kind of just lock myself in my room growing up for a summer if I wanted to like kind of just think things through and try to figure out, like you said, going from maybe transitioning mm. from one year to the next and trying to define myself or find myself at any given time. But at that time, I just poured everything into these type of external, mm. you, know, you know, like buckets almost, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And so, yeah. you know, at, at some point in time, I was trying to juggle it all. And, you know, I was really good, you know, at my, my work fields, mm. I, I was in sales or customer service or hospitality. And then, I kind of was just managing those two buckets of trying to perform at whatever my job was at the time yeah. and then keeping this party going, right? Which was actually something that was novel to me because I was more introverted mm. growing up. And then it was kind of a an awakening of this aspect of oh, my I'm life. I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, and so I, I found, I think, too much comfort in it. Mm. And also with the experimentation of different recreational drugs, really. Yeah. And so that kind of opened the door to finding, you know, I think everybody has kind of like their their weakness. And of if course. You, if we you, all have an Achilles heel, right? Yeah. And if probably. You, if you go out and experimenting with everything, you're probably going to find it eventually. Mm. And so for me, that was crystal meth. And man, it was really a really fast drop off. Wow. Can you kind of take us back to, to those days, those times, like what was it not to put words in your mouth, but in my experience, my understanding when it comes to becoming hooked, reliant, addicted to hard substances such as that, it's because it provides such an extreme escape from something else. Were you aware of that at the time? Did you feel like this is an escape from it? What were you finding you know, sanctuary in, in this world in a way that you couldn't outside? I think for me, the other substances provided a better kind of break from reality. Really? And I'd never had, I mean, I was using too much to be okay. honest, right? So it was kind of in 99, 2000, it was like a, a very candy rave scene, right? It was uh -huh, like a, uh -huh. a, everybody cuddle puddles and a lot of ecstasy <laughs> and, uh, and, those parties, they, they continued and perpetuated through those years, but I was able to manage the two mm. to some degree. And what had happened was I was commuting to Silicon Valley from Monterey where I lived and still partying all the time. I got introduced to crystal meth and what happened was I was supposed to be sleeping, but I couldn't sleep. And so then it was time to perform at work. Mm. And then I, I used just to be able to get through that, but then sure. the cycle perpetuated. You kind of get stuck. I got stuck in this cycle where I couldn't control the natural ebbs and flows of when I could, you know, perform and recover, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. uh, before I knew it, you know, a week or two later, I was like, man, this is way out of control. And then that continued for another year and a half. Did you decide, did you realize... I have an addiction, I have a problem, I have something that is spiraling out of control, or did you have kind of like an outside force or person or event kind of shake you out of that? Definitely the latter. I mean, uh, in terms of be, being willing to receive the information, uh -huh, I, I uh -huh. think there was definitely an acknowledgement that things were not good, right? Mm -hmm. And I mean, I was 130 pounds at one point in time here. A little, and a little smaller than you are now, little, man. A little, I, I would a eat little that leaner. guy. <laughs> you know? And so, um, you know, I was wow. 130 pounds when I was in seventh grade. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So it was, it was definitely something I, I was aware of. But it was back to that concept of apathy. It was just that I didn't care enough mm. to fix my own stuff, right? So a friend of mine was like, it was involved in that scene as well, but he like grabbed me by the shoulders one day. And shook me. He was like, "Man, where? Basically, where are where are you? Where's my friend? You know?" Wow, no shit. And I was just a shell of myself at the time. So I was like, "Man, I I should really feel something right now." Mm. You know, I'm, I'm historically very empathic, and so I didn't feel I didn't feel anything. And so I, wow. I went home in my stupor, you know, and uh, I was thinking, "Geez, something's really really wrong." Mm. And in that moment of reflection, being able to see in that person's eyes, the pain that I was causing someone I cared about. Wow. It's huge. Yeah. Made me realize yeah. like, man, this is a lot bigger than me just hurting me. Right. And so I initiated a conversation with my mom. I was like, Hey mom, you know, obviously I know something's wrong because you've, I've avoided you for a year, <laughs> you know, and wow. uh, sat her down at the table. I was like, you know, just want to let you know, I appreciate you giving me the space to work through my stuff, but I'm going to let you know it's, mm. I'm going to fix it now. So that's huge. We're going to, you're going to see a, a shift and man, it was, it was really kind of just a couple of those moments mm. that I was able to draw perspective and strength from, but man, it was a, it was a tough road to climb out of that hole. No doubt. And I, I loved hearing at that moment that you kind of, it was, it was a greater sense of awareness of other people. Uh, I'm sure it, it definitely sounds like you were aware of kind of the detriment that you were causing yourself. But mm -hmm. what really shook you out of that was realizing the pain that I was causing these other people that I care about, which in my experience, I, I personally haven't been there, but what I know of addiction is that that's kind of the ultimate 
shakeup that people are trying to get is like, hey, you may be doing whatever you want with your life, but you're actually wreaking havoc on supposedly the people that you love and care about the most. Yeah. And that's the thing is it really was an awakening because a lot of the pain that led me to that state of apathy was this the loss of love, loved ones in terms of this plane, right? And this this existence. How so? How so? What did that look like? What did that feel like? So it was because, you know, my grandmother represented almost like a second mom, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so grandfather, he was a very, you know, gruff, you know, retiree. And mm -hmm. he, he was very much about authority, right? So you think about the most nurturing person I probably had in my life growing up. Because my mom was busy, so mm -hmm. my grandmother was always available, right, mm -hmm. emotionally and and energetically. And then my grandfather representing, in many ways, the, the ultimate father figure in terms of the familial infrastructure. And so yeah. it's kind of like that mother-father role, you know, like… That's a duality. Yeah, self yeah. and, you know, the… Authority and, mm -hmm. and, and relationship, spiritual relationship. So, okay. So it, those poles felt off, but then the third loss was actually my uncle who committed suicide, and I I didn't really, I don't think I really unpacked mm. the reality of how painful it was for him to make this decision that wow. that hurt us all, yeah. you know, in such a profound way. And I know that that I had a lot of guilt because we had a an opportunity to, to connect shortly before it happened. And he was sharing where he was at and I plead with him to, to he have a different perspective. All the, like, so this was on his mind. He made that aware to you. Yeah. He made it aware. It, it wasn't wow. something that. It's a lot know, of weight to take. It was. And, and I think that really hit hard when everything kind of happened. But then I was so blind to the fact that even though he may have done a singular act mm. or, or there was a variety of acts prior to, right? Sure. That, that removed him, is, yeah. removed him from, from our lives that I was essentially chronically making the same choice, right? And not taking into account the cost it would have on mm. the people I, I still loved and had in, in my life, you know? So it was, it was a really tough thing to realize like, oh man, I'm, I'm doing exactly what. Wow. What he he was doing, you know, and and maybe and it didn't. you saw the aftermath, and so that kind of registered. I don't want that. Yeah, you know, I can't I can't do this to yeah. the people I love, and and so yeah, it was it really all it all came to me in these mm -hmm. very few moments, and I just I feel like you know this is so much about what gives life purpose. Mm -hmm. It happens in these little flashes, right? These changes of of perspective can happen in just just one moment you know the one look in someone's eyes or uh one touch you know one one interaction sometimes can be so powerful if we pause even just for a moment to realize it mm -hmm. yeah because i i realize that the more and more that i go through my own personal work i realize i've had so many of these moments in the past but i just wasn't present enough i wasn't out of my own head enough i wasn't thinking of others enough um so it's all these little gifts that you're talking about are there it's just how are we going to be present enough to actually pay attention and receive them you know well it's tough you know i think we we're just talking about um the distractible nature of the world yeah. we live in right yeah. and so you, you have the constant barrage of more information of more pixels, you know, <laughs> literally, literally, yeah. you know, and, and, and you compound that with the reality that we're so hyper aware of ourselves in the sense that we, we can't even really be here with someone else oftentimes because we're so worried about maybe mm. how you think of me or, you know, do I look right or do mm. I, you know, and it, it's, um, it is hard to be present enough to be aware of like even a a profound moment when it happens or even to look back and, and have the opportunity to unpack it. Right? And appreciate it. Yeah. yeah. What's, um, I forget who, but there's this quote that I heard this year that I love and it's, I'm not who I think I am. I am who I think you think I am. And I think that's the perpetual cycle that so many of us are in, in myself included time to time. It's just like you just said, it's just, how do you think that I look? How do you think that I sound? What's the image, the persona, the success, the the struggle that I'm giving off that you're perceiving? And like that creates my reality when I can actually create my own reality and be in tune with yours at the same time. 
but it, you know, and it's it's a lot to ask to be, you know, to break that spell. Yeah, you know? yeah, and, yeah. I like that. And it's I think it's really important to acknowledge we're all we're all subjected to it. Maybe we have the opportunity to yeah. to, to drop into being present, like you said, in 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 moments and expand those moments into greater greater windows of opportunity. But absolutely. But but yeah, I think it's it's a it's a lot it's it's a lot to ask everybody to be able to do it all the time. But to be able to do it at all, I think is this is a great gift, you know? Amen, brother. Amen. Well, somebody probably watching this and hearing what we just talked about would think this is very on brand, but like where we are is leaps and bounds down the journey uh, from what we were just talking about. Um, did you just naturally gravitate towards fitness and training in such unique ways? Was that a therapy for you where you were already there like because yeah. we're talking about a lot of the inner work man but you've done a lot of the exterior work and like we're in one of the best training centers you know in the u.s i think and just so much of what on it and your work represents here is is the exterior self is fitness is strength is optimization is movement like how did you go from from there to here man well it's really the interplay right uh. you know so like for me you know what i realized is I think, um, you know, what is recovery, right? Mm. Recovery is reclaiming something that was lost, right? And to, in many ways. And so, so many lessons that I needed to get out of this situation I put myself in, I had been granted those lessons earlier in life. And mm. mm -hmm. so, I, I started revisiting, like, what really created a framework of, of strength and resolve uh, you know, like, where did I learn the things that up to that point really drove me to be successful in the things that I had poured myself into? And it was ah. early in life. I was part of a, a community of in the martial arts community. And, mm. and my sensei was a, a really amazing teacher, but he was a, a great role model as well. Mm. And we had, you know, bylaws that we were held to a certain standard not necessarily just about our performance physically, but the way we perceive ourselves and the responsibility that we took on being part of this community. Like life principles. Exactly. Right? Yeah. 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 And, and, you know, we talked about stoicism. It was, mm. it was very stoic in nature. These I bet. Bylaws. I bet. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, to be introduced to that at four years old and to be in that community growing up, I never realized what a great gift that was. And it was really interesting because my sensei, he was a hand-to-hand -hand combatives instructor in the in the army. Wow, wow! And he got to travel around the world and and be exposed to a variety of different arts. No doubt. And so yeah. he was like Western boxing, Okinawan karate, Chinese boxing, and he integrated all these things into what he called bojuka, which was boxing, judo, jiu-jitsu, and karate. Right. Say that again. What, what, what was the bojuka? Bojuka. That was that's his term. Yeah, and so it, you wow. know he got uh, recognized for this martial art that was really an amalgamation of other things. Right. Really. Yeah. And so if you look at what what has evolved in naturally now in martial arts, you have mixed martial arts. Yeah. But at that time, it was kind of you know not really accepted to kind of. It wasn't a thing yet, really. It wasn't. <laughs> yeah. But what he would always highlight would be that, you know, like you'd hear the saying, you know, you wrestle a boxer, you box a wrestler, you know? And <laughs> and so we were able to adapt because we weren't looking at solving every problem the same way. We had a, a diverse skill set in, in a variety of different perspectives. We would fight in a karate tournament. We'd fight in a judo tournament. Mm. We would have to box, right? And so- you started looking at, well, I'm going to use what is proving to be most effective in this situation. Hmm. And so if I take that lesson and all of those fundamental principles of who I should be and what beliefs drive me towards a more optimal version of myself and the responsibility, accepting the responsibility of taking action huge, in those ways, huge. Yeah, yeah. you know, and I find myself in this really bad place. I was like, well, like you said, where did all this weird fitness stuff come? You know, like kettlebells, clubs, maces, battle ropes. Realistically, I was just looking for something that looked and felt a lot more like those kind of experiences growing up. 
And what, what could be like a tether back to this old infrastructure you had? Exactly. Because yeah. I guess I could have went back into martial art, mm. but I felt like my body was in such a state that I needed to rebuild my physicality. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And through that process, be able to start demonstrating the ability to exert my will to create a better version of myself. So if I could do more physically, then I was demonstrating the ability to, you know, not necessarily control my emotions yeah. or control my thoughts directly, but indirectly create belief systems that fed the ability to, to manifest, like you said, to yeah, be yeah, yeah, yeah. something that obviously I, I didn't believe I was at those times that I was making really bad decisions. And so all that stuff really, they're kind of different art forms. Truly. Right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and we at on it, like if you have an affinity for something and I have the ability to use that mm. as an entry point to facilitate a holistic transformation, then man, that's where I'm going to go. Right. I love it. I love it. So when you were kind of grabbing these devices and going through this training, um, did it, did it immediately, did it somewhat at all like represent like strength? I'm picking this up because I'm letting something else go. I am swinging this kettlebell as if, you know, you know, it, was it metaphorical for you as you were kind of going through this healing and strength building process? Was it like a, an obvious shedding of a former self or did you just know and feel that I just got to do something different? Yeah. You know, at first it was like, I went back to, you know, growing up, everybody was influenced by the build, bodybuilding scene. So, oh yeah, yeah. So I went yeah. there first because that's what I knew, but then I was seeking out additional information and something that I said would parallel kind of the martial arts principles okay, and, and the, the, the feeling of that practice. And so got exposed to kettlebells and mm. clubs and really unconventional uh, ground-based movement that were kind of inspired by martial arts or mm -hmm. folkloric dance of a variety of different cultures. You know? I love that. I love it. Pulling from everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, we all stand on the shoulders of giants we say, yeah. right. So, yeah. so, you know, got exposed to a lot of different things from other coaches. And I was like, well, this is kind of like my, new martial art. Right. And Love so, it. so it wasn't necessarily obvious metaphorical, you know, like representation of a, a metaphorical change, but mm. it was just something I could pour myself into that I correlated directly with, with something I valued in the past. And then as that process unfolded, it did become exactly yeah. what you're talking about. Right. When did you know that you had something? Because, um, when all this was happening, I'm assuming here, but like that time frame, this stuff wasn't popular or it wasn't no. as popular as it, as it is now. So how did you kind of, how did you know that you had something here for yourself and like, how did it grow? You know, there was a, so there was a, a series of articles in this magazine called muscle media 2000. And throw it was, back. yeah, throw back, throw back. And it, they were written by Pavel Satsulin. And I just really liked his, his writing style mm. and the information was so easy to apply, especially where I was and to see positive re return. And yeah. so for me, it was just a measure of like willingness to put units of mm. work in and, and getting return on investment. And that early investment kind of opening the door to my willingness to pour more energy mm. into exploring kind of outward, mm -hmm. right? not only depth, but breadth. And so it was 2003 and I spent most of that year just exploring and training like multiple hours of every day. And it just worked, right? Because it was an intensive practice. It displaced my addictions with something that, you know, was positive and, yeah, and yeah. provided a platform for continued growth. And, and so it, it worked, but Without a doubt, when I was doing everything, everybody was like, what is this weird stuff you're yeah, doing? Yeah, what are you doing? Yeah, yeah. And also, like, how is this fitness? <laughs> exactly, because it didn't yeah. really does not compute. Yeah. You know, for most people, you're like, you're not pumping iron in the traditional sense. It was very fringe at the time. And it's still fringe to to the the broader masses. Mm -hmm. Kettlebells you can find everywhere, but you can't find maces and clubs. And, no, no. And, uh, and a lot of the movement skills have been, you know, like, in terms of, animal-based movements or ground-based movements, you see the proliferation of these things happening 
more recently, you know, like the last 10 years at the most, yeah. at the most really gaining more momentum. But at the time, you know, I would go to Gold's Gym and bring my own equipment and they're like, man. Oh, no yeah, shit. Yeah. Tarzan over there. Watch out for him, you know? <laughs> you, that's not covered in our liability insurance. Sorry. You can't be bringing your own shit in here. Yeah. It was, it was pretty wild, but you said like, did I, uh, did I fall into the, everything right away? And it was really funny because I went through all this education, 2003, I, I didn't train someone else for like compensation until 2007, 2008. Wow. And, but I had literally a bunch of different uh, career fields I dove into. Mm -hmm. I worked uh, with autistic children as a behavior modification specialist. Oh shit. Wow. I, I worked in uh mortgage. So in the finance industry. You're all and, over. And everywhere I went, a kettlebell was with me, <laughs> you know? So, really? Yeah. At my cube, they're like, yeah, John really? always had a kettlebell at his desk. Damn, man. And Walking so, the walk, talking the talk. It, yeah. And if anybody would even like comment on, I'm like, okay, yeah, let me show let you. Let me show you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You have like- a, No, no, I don't want to work out. I'm just saying it's cool. Yeah. yeah. You know, you had like swinger parties in my garage, but it wasn't the way <laughs> that you think. It was it was kettlebell swinging, right? So, it, and so it was really funny because it was, you know, when yeah. you find something that really changes- your life for the better, you're always willing to share it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, fast forward 2008, the whole, you know, economy took a crap mm. and I really enjoyed working with people to help them realize the American dream, right? Like get in their first home or be able to keep their home. And oh yeah. People were losing their homes and like crying at my desk. And I was like, man, this is really stressing me out because I don't have any solutions and, you know, I'm not making the type of money I was making before. So why don't I just pour everything I have into what I actually still love and passionate about and what I feel like could benefit people in this really hard time. And in what all you literally lives. have been bringing to work with you for years. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It was, it was you had a side a, hustle and didn't even know it, man. I, I didn't it, even it's, know. It's this tether right here. This probably 50 pound tether. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Exactly. You know, and, and it was a, it was a, it was an interesting hmm. time to start a new business, but I just felt like, it was a calling and, and, uh, it was in alignment with my beliefs and who I yeah. was or who I wanted to be. And it led me through, you know, the opportunity to get, continue to stand on those shoulders of new giants, like yeah, continue to integrate new ideas and new methodologies. And, uh, it led me here, man. This a is a beautiful place to wind up, beautiful I, place to be on your journey. I could not ask for more, you know, I want to go, go back briefly, um, to the concept of addiction, um, mm -hmm. because I think now we've painted the full circle picture of what you went through in your life, your family, loss, your addiction. Would you say you struggle with addiction? Like addiction is a word you use to define substance abuse or your period of your life. Is that fair? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Just with the, how addiction works, um, do you feel like, is it a reality that you've traded one addiction for another from abusing substances, meth uh, to, to, to fitness? Yeah. I think, you know, that is such a, a, a great question because displacement is kind of what most people with an addictive personality. That's or, why I asked. Right. Yeah. yeah. W would look at like a solution. Mm -hmm. And what I've come to realize was in the short term, it might, might be the only viable solution, right. To mm -hmm. displace the energy you pour into one you know, obsessive kind of compulsive hmm. agenda into something else that hopefully is a lot healthier. But what I've also come to realize as time had gone on was that there, there definitely needed to be a change in the dynamic of that relationship. The contract there it had is. to change. There it is. That's huge. Yeah. And that like, I could not continue to do fitness to, to displace or to avoid doing inner work, I need to be in good relationship with myself, mm. with my body, that my body isn't this, this, this vehicle that I'm going to take out my inner frustrations or needs on my physical body because it wouldn't be able to keep up with mm. the, the need to satisfy or slay the inner demons. Right. And so as I've got to be in the role of coaching and, and, and trying to help other people you know, facilitate better outcomes for themselves. Mm. I, I realize, like, you know, a lot of people get into fitness to displace these types of of 
habits that are more destructive. Usually, yeah. It's pretty common, I would say. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But that at some point in time, we have to realize that negative emotion poured into what we perceive as a positive, Mm. you know, outlet is still going to, at some point in time, catch up and realize that we're we're still feeding that attachment to the negative energy source, right? Like we're still fueling this cycle. Absolutely. Yeah. And and it, it took a lot of learning, but- you know, the f- framework and the kind of more holistic approach and the focus on injury recovery, because I did create a bunch of injuries. Sure. Anybody right. in the game, you know, hell for a year plus, you, you're going to bang yourself up a little bit. <laughs> Especially if you're trying to use it to displace this other thing. Very right? true. Very and true. And so, yeah. you know, I went down that path and I realized like, oh, shit, I need to do a better job of of my why. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so now it, it really is about, you know, like, and through on it, we get to present this kind of framework and overlay or inter interlace, uh, like conscious coaching, you know, conscious use of language that in, like people are in this, uh, hyper receptive state where mm-hmm. they're, they're kind of at the level of their skill at any given time, if I'm coaching them well or mm. presenting them well, that they're always kind of right at that point where they can create flow, right? Where skill and effort kind of intersect. Yes. Right. Yeah, yeah. And, and that creates this, this profound state of receptivity. So the, the coaching cues that you hear, if you check out any of our digital fitness products, it's not meant to drive them mm. harder is mm meant to drive more awareness and to change to the drop inner in dialogue. Yeah. yeah. And so through that, they can, they can decide to push further, mm. but there's a lot of, a, a lot of qualifying like perspectives we want them to be empowered with so that they sure. don't, they don't just do what many of us have done, uh-huh. which is just trying to kind of run faster away from the thing that we need to, to face. Right. Can you share with us maybe uh, a tactic, a technique, a modality that you see work really well for yourself to do just that, or maybe a way that you share with you know clients or in the content you provide here at On It? Yeah, man. You know, it's it's really funny. So I got granted my my pass, you know, <laughs> to On It uh, after interviewing with Aubrey and and Aubrey. You know, he's such a visionary. So much mm-hmm. of what we have at On It, it's not from a, it's not here because it made business sense and it was a strategic thing. It was because there were things he valued Mm -hmm. and he wanted to be surrounded by the things that he felt impacted him in a positive way with the want to make it available to other people. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so they had decided after creating monkey face kettlebells and (laughs) and, they put put those on the map for sure and bringing clubs and maces because of the historical implications of these old training methods, and, and so they brought me in to interview to create an education system. And the education system is really predicated on longevity and performance. And so if, if we're looking at that, you know, it's like the, the first, the first thing you do is usually your priority, right? Right. Yeah. 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 And so the, the words longevity prior to performance, it, it is there intentionally because uh, we feel like if we can progress indefinitely without backsliding, mm. then we're going to reach closer to your optimal I love potential, that, right? I love that. I love the intention behind the design of all of this. Yeah. And so we open our education with essentially this concept of using mobility practices to open up a dialogue with your body, mm. right? Because essentially, you know, we feel like fitness is a, you know, something you're doing in a, usually a a safe and controlled space mm. it, it, because fitness isn't really life. It's, it's something we've created to offset. Yeah. Not anymore, at least. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, I mean, not, a, not of this century. <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, back then it was just, you lived, you, your, your fitness was predicated on your ability to, to be a soldier or yeah. be a, you know, a hunter gatherer. Provider, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But now it's just something that we supplement our lifestyle with yeah. to offset the fact that we don't live in a way that's harmonious with our body. Mm. And so our goal is to create an environment where you have the ability to create a better conversation with your mm. body and that you understand like, 
as you explore what moves and doesn't move, mm-hmm. and you, I know you have a lot of history mm-hmm. with that, mm-hmm. that you accept responsibility that you're the one who made the decisions that cost your body. That's a better pill sometimes. <laughs> oh yeah. man, it's tough. And, and then, you know, I use, you know, this example. So, you know, we've all had intimate relationships, right? And so you're ultimately having an intimate relationship with your body because we don't look at our body and our self yeah. Yeah, as one. A lot of times we're like talking to our body, mm. like, can't believe you won't let me play today. You, <laughs> you, you freaking knee, you hip, whatever yeah. it is, right? Yeah. And you get mad at you and you have this really uh, you know, unhealthy it's so true. <laughs> it's so true. But then if we can start our fitness practice yeah. with kind of like having this conversation, a check-in, it's kind of like, yeah, if I go home after a long day and yeah, maybe my wife is kind of to have dinner ready for me, mm-hmm. but if I get uh, presumptive and I get home and it's not ready, I'm like, how come dinner's not ready? What's mm-hmm. going on? Like with the, with the unsupportive tone, What's the outcome going to be? Probably not good. Probably not probably good. Not good yeah. I'm probably not. Got, I'm probably not going to have dinner at all <laughs> that night or many nights thereafter. <laughs> but but if if I go home and I instead of being reactive to mm. what's happening real time, then this is kind of that conversation, right? Yeah. Communication conversation. Instead of saying like, "Oh, this hurts," or "It doesn't," it's not. It's not in a good state. Instead of being like, "Oh, how dare you?" I think like, "Okay, well." What can I do to help the situation? So if I get home and dinner's not ready, you're like, oh, shoot, the kids are yelling and running around. All right, hey, babe, I'm going to go get get these guys, get them in the tub or doing whatever. Like, okay, the, the vegetables aren't chopped. Let me go ahead and start doing this. Do you want a rough chop or whatever, you know? And, yeah. and just be part of the solution. You know, it's such a big shift accepting that responsibility. He says a bitter yeah. pill, yeah, he said, yeah, right? Yeah, it can be. And so, like, if that's the, the entry point, then – we can make a whole bunch of really informed decisions about how to get one step better every time we start the conversation that way. Absolutely, man. Um, and I really do think that is such a key concept there of, of the whole concept of the work that I do and why we're here today and what I say it means to live a life ever forward is you have to first accept responsibility. Um, accept responsibility for where you are, where you are not, what you have, what you have not what you have done, what you haven't done, you know, the good, the bad, the ugly, and everything in between. If you can work through that radical responsibility, there's a lot of empowerment in that. A lot of empowerment in what you have accomplished and the infrastructure you have and the love that you have, but also a revelation of the work yet to be done. And not in a scary way, but just like, okay, good. You know, here's the work. Here are the things that I get to maintain that I need to maintain, but also here's the work before me so that I can move forward in life. Well, you don't have to be numb anymore, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, very true. Accepting all this creates a, an, a potentially epic journey if you're yeah. willing to take just that next step forward. And 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 this is the thing, like, you know, uh, so we have these, uh, a, a library of digital fitness products. So I, I think yeah, I told yeah. you we we're about to launch our digital fitness ed, uh, education I've seen course. the promos for me, by the way. They're, they're oh. phenomenal, man. They look good. They look good. Yeah, we're, we're stoked on it. So we were doing live events for a long time. And so that mm-hmm. education framework that we were kind of just talking about is to now evolve to a digital because we're not doing as many live events sure, and things. Sure. And so, but then we also have these six-week home fitness programs. And then these kind of bite-sized, like get on it in 30 minutes or less, right? Yeah, I love it. But ultimately, it all is based on this education framework. And it's evolved to have these uh, six-week transformation challenges. Mm-hmm. But, you know, these uh, challenges historically are very aesthetic or very, sure, you know, yeah. like, in, in, and people yeah. get in for that reason, right? But yeah. it's really been fun because- The bait works. The bait works, a lot yeah. Of times, yeah. Because, you know, you're going to give them what they want to give them what they need, mm-hmm. right? And so they they buy in because they might have what they, they might assess later was a more superficial goal mm-hmm. and then realize they're there for a much more purposeful reason. Mm-hmm to realize themselves in a different light. And, and so some of the people who came through, you know, um, when they're asked about it and we get to review, like it, it's not a transformation challenge in the sense like, Oh, who lost the most weight? It really is. Uh, we have these essays that people submit and videos. Oh, shit. That's and, amazing. And it's about like, how did the participation and challenge change your, your well being? That's, that's change amazing, your habits man. change how you show up within 
your social circles, whether that's your, your family, your community. The large. bigger picture of the change you're creating. And, yeah. So they can yeah. internalize all that, right? And then, um, and then one of our participants was like John and Shane, who's my director of education, a friend of mine that's been part of this journey f- from the get-go, mm-hmm. right? And they're like, they, they don't motivate you by trying to crack a whip. They're always trying to help you see that you're doing these acts out of love mm. for self and love for the ability to be of greater service. And I was like, man, that's, you know, that, that, that's like, okay, I'm doing, <laughs> a, I'm doing a good job. And yeah. as we talked about that, that trap of, of seeking superficial satisfaction, which again is a good bait, but it, we got to, it, it's never going to be, it's never going to satisfy you. Mm-hmm. Right. You get there in the long term. Yeah. It's like getting a new car. Yeah, oh, yeah. that's so awesome. And then that's just another car yeah, as, yeah. as time goes on. Right. And I lost 10 pounds, but what's next? And, and so it, it's just been really fulfilling to be able to facilitate any change like that for any number of people, much less be here at on it mm. and be empowered by a brand that essentially espouses those same beliefs and is a, a platform for it and a, and a has gravity. Oh yeah, for and fans, your flame to grow at all at the same time. It's it's just man, it, it is phenomenal. And get to come hang out here with with this you. Is amazing, yeah. Thank you. Thank Ever you. forward, man. Yeah. You know, we're talking about. It's the the direct parallel, mm. you know, like that longevity and performance, right? Ever forward. That's what I'm after. Yeah. yeah. And it, it means a lot of different things. But, you know, speaking of, um, I would love to get your interpretation, John, as, as we wrap up here. I, I think it's very apparent in your story and in your message and you live it. But when you hear those two words, I want to ask you exactly, what does living a life ever forward mean to you? How do you, how do you receive that today? Oh, man. If it's okay, I got to draw back to a, a There's conversation. No right or wrong answer, man. It's just yours. The, to me, what I see is this. Uh, it, it, it parallels a couple of the things that we just talked about and talked about before we start started recording. To this, this ability to stay on mission, right? And so, I remember I was in my old studio in California, and I was, you know, you, as a coach, you hang out with people and you get a really good peek into what their current living situation is mm, in their mm-hmm. self. Right. Mm-hmm. And so, so th- this person was really down on themselves because they weren't able to make the type of lifestyle changes that they really hope to, you know, it's really easy to have, be really bought in up front until you start realizing like, man, I got to make choices all the time <laughs> that are aligned with this goal. No truer words have been spoken <laughs> on the journey. Yeah. Like this is a lot harder than I thought. Like every day? Yeah. Really? <laughs> Multiple times a day? Hours? Oh man. And so, you know, I I uh I just felt inspired to tell them and this is this is kind of what I think with Ever Forward and it just love this this parallel, this kind of synchronicity. Mm, yeah. But essentially I told him, I was like, you know, what if your goal was was represented by that front door, right? Mm-hmm. And I just want you to commit to move towards that door, you know, what that door represents no matter what happens, right? And so immediately he's like, okay, cool, yeah, boom. You know, because it always seems simple yeah. up front, but then I stand in front of him. <laughs> and he's like, well, what, what are you getting my way for? <laughs> like, why are you worried about me? Mm. I'm inconsequential. If your only purpose is to get to realize your goal, your purpose, and it's at the door, just move around. He he would move around and I pushed him and he got mad. And I was like, if these are the things that are going to get you off, you know, your your purpose and your path, then yeah, it's going to get really hard because, you know, this is just a game. Yeah. But- I'd say, you know, for me, ever forward means that same thing, you know, what that conversation represented for me and that person, I feel it's really important, as you said, to accept responsibility for where you are, where you aren't, to to create a, a plan, a path, a vision, a purpose for where you are going forward. Something, anything. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's going to change and that's okay. But until it changes, like, like find ways to get 
one step, one inch closer. Yeah. And, you know, I think we talked about me fumbling and bumbling mm. to, to, <laughs> to be, to find myself here. But I just always felt like, you know, that concept of failing forward. Like yeah, if, yeah. if I was going to fall, I'm just going to fall in the direction and then I'm going to pick myself and dust myself off. And hopefully nobody noticed because I'm actually a little bit closer than, than I was, Truly. you know? And, uh, and that's that's probably an oversimplistic perspective, but to me, when you, when we talked about, yeah. you know, what that means, that that's really probably the best representation. I, I love that, man. That was a really, really great interpretation. Um, like I said, there's never a right or wrong answer. It's just it is how you receive it, and um, that's why I love connecting with people like yourself, man. Because I think even before having this conversation with you, like I could tell, like learning more about your backstory and all the things that you've gone through and what life has thrown at you and what you've thrown back at life. Um, you know, you're just putting one foot in front of the other and, uh, figuring it out and taking responsibility along the way. Yeah. Hopefully doing, doing my part, man. Absolutely, man. Well, John, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, we're gonna have all of your information down in the show notes, the video notes for everybody to check out, but where can you send them right now to learn more about you and what you're offering and this incredible stuff at on it? Yeah, check me out on IG. That's where all the fitness mm -hmm. stuff lives these days is a visual medium, right? So Coach John Wolf mm -hmm. uh, at Coach John Wolf. But ultimately, you know, what I do in my work and life is often and almost always really through the Onnit platform. So Onnit, uh, at Onnit, O-N-N-I-T. So two N's, as is. you see. Yeah. And uh, and uh, Onnit.com, you know, like I, like I said, I'm just really uh, – really blessed to have found myself here and uh, really happy that we got to hang out today, man. Likewise, bro.